So today we'll have uh, Dr. Lal, uh, who's going to speak to us on uh, anesthesia and how safe it is. Uh, Dr. Lal, may I look at you? Thank you, Dr. Mishwit. Before starting, actually, I want to congratulate Dr. Mishwit for taking our CPD to great heights. A couple of weeks back, I got a mail from him. This is a mail actually stating the ground rules. You are allowed only 20 minutes, 10 minutes for question and answer session, and the presentation. I know this is on the previous day, and uh, keep in mind the sensitivity of the audience, that I like very much actually. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Arun, you be careful. <laughs> you be careful. So, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, no, I also did this, nobody understood what I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, I am allowed 20 minutes, so I think my start, time starts now. Once it goes beyond, please, sir, please, okay, raise your hand. Coming to anesthesia, always I looked upon anesthesia with great wonder because after my MBBS in 1990, completing my MBBS, I joined in a medical college in Kerala as a lecturer in anesthesia. At that time, I don't know anything about anesthesia. And the first day I saw surgery is doing operating uh, surgery on uh, on patient leg actually on spinal anesthesia, and the patient is watching. I was surprised actually. A patient is enjoying the operation doing in his own body. That really impressed me. And later, I, uh, under general anesthesia, surgeon is allowed to do any amount of cutting, stitching, then nailing, screwing, all sorts of things, any, any uh, amount of time. And after that, the patient is coming out as if nothing has happened. And they are asking, is it over? Isn't it a miracle actually? So that impressed me and that paved me to, uh, drag me to this anesthesia actually. Then, uh, but people coming to anesthesia, they have a lot of concerns. During the time of uh, pre anesthetic checkup, only we will know what all things are there in the minds of the people. Uh, some people, they don't want general anesthesia. They say that, they say that see doctor, if I go into the uh, sleep, okay, you are putting me in sleep. But what happens if I didn't come out of anesthesia? So they are afraid of uh, general anesthesia for that. And uh, then some people, they, they tell that, okay, you are putting me in sleep, but whether I will not experience any pain while, while the surgeon is doing the surgery, doing cutting, and what will happen after the surgery, pain, I am worried about the pain, so they have a lot of concern about the pain. Then some people, they have very much worried that if the surgery prolongs, whether I will get up in the middle of the surgery and see the surgeon is doing surgery, it's really embarrassing. So. Uh, uh, that kind of certain people, especially under spinal anesthesia, after giving spinal anesthesia, they will not feel the lower feelings, etc. So many a time we will see that after giving spinal anesthesia, they are just touching the uh, thighs to make sure that the limbs are there, legs are there like that. So they are worried about whether that paralyzed me forever. Some people they will have, if you tell about the uh, spinal anesthesia period, they will tell that whether it will carry on for chronic back pain or chronic mobility. So these are the concerns of the patients that we have to address the concern and best time is at the time of pre and pre checkup. Then only we, uh, we have to sort it out their concerns actually. Then anesthesia actually is an reactive uh, thing actually. Doctors, we are inducing a physiological change to give anesthesia. So it should be given in a proper way, otherwise it can uh, land up, we will land up in a lot of morbidity and mortality. So definitely anesthesia is a high risk activity. In short, actually, we will see how safe anesthesia or how uh, uh, safely we can give anesthesia. Uh, we are coming to the statistics actually in 1950. There is some 70 years before, there is no anesthesia department, there is no proper anesthesia people. Only surgeon used to give anesthesia and they put the tube and give the back to the system, the system will squeeze the back. In between, the surgeon will say, give some, uh, a relaxant, some relaxant when they feel that the muscles are tight like that. And gynecologists, they used to use spinal anesthesia and they themselves do the uh, same section like that. That was the previous time. But the problem at the time is that the, the mortality is very high. So, one in thousand. So, at the time, if you tell anybody you have to undergo surgery, it's a nightmare, not only for the patients, but to the family as well. So, they don't know the patient is going inside to the theater, will come alive. There's no guarantee actually, come alive out. So, if you see on during that time, uh, any surgery, the patient is coming to the theatre with a big crowd. 
their friends, relatives, everybody will come because they are not sure that the patient will come uh, back alive. So that's the situation at that time. And in 1970, uh, actually, the, again, slight improvement was there. It's one death per 5,006. And in 2000, the statistics says that it is one death per 300,000. The safety has improved a lot. And also, uh, the complication rates are also com considerably reduced. So this is a case of an ideal anesthesia. You should have a good mind. You should be a good mind reader. Always thinking about sponge count and blood loss. You should have an eye on around to look up the machine, uh, <laughs> monitors, any fluids, uh, patient's face, and you feel, etc. And they should have a topic to smile. Always they should smile. Whatever insert they get from patients, by standards, so it is colleagues. <laughs> That's the ideal one. Then they should have a, a neck, should rotate 360 round, they should look around. And they need uh, 10 arms to take at the table, the regulator, hold the, uh, hold the mask, with the mask, and then hold the uh, thumb, uh, keep the uh, fingers on the pulse, all sorts of things they need more and they need a small stomach, many, many a time they cannot many a time they cannot uh, take food, so they will have small stomach, they will have big bladder because many a time they cannot go to the washroom. <laughs> <laughs> they will have leaves under the, as if they have leaves under the food because they, they have to move very swift, swiftly like that. This is about the ideal answers. But in spite of all that, complications are there because patients coming for surgery, they have a pathology, some problem for which they are coming for surgery. On top of them, that they will have additional comorbidities like uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, cardiac problems, and renal and uh, other problems actually. So uh, naturally, the complications are there. Let us see what are the complications that can arise uh, uh, for like an anesthesia. There are major complications and minor complications. Major complications are can go cardiac arrest, perioperative myocardial infarction, aspiration, especially if the uh, elective surgery patients in full stomach, then anaphylaxis. We don't know which all patients will go for anaphylaxis, and then drug toxicity or overdose can occur. Again, awareness sometimes in between the patients, they will come to know everything, but they cannot respond. Then conversions can occur, then no palsies, organ injury, and malignant hyperthermia. So these are the major problems which encounter a falling anesthesia. There are few minor problems which will set in a few hours or uh, definitely, it will not go beyond 24 hours. They are dry mouth because we immediately after surgery, uh, the postoperative they will complain of dry mouth. Then damage to mouth, lips, tooth. Then postoperative nausea and vomiting. Then sore throat, especially if you put a tube or a LMA, they will have complaint of sore throat for some time. Then persistent sedation in the recovery room. Hemodynamic instability. They will have some hypertension, hypotension, bradycardia, tachycardia. Then they will have shivering some people, then they will have delirium, they will start talking, all sorts of things, and later they will not remember that. And then organ dysfunction and cognitive defect. Cognitive defect and loss of memory sometimes short term can occur. And again, the cognitive defects depend upon the duration of surgery. If the surgery duration of anesthesia, if anesthesia is prolonged, then the chance of cognitive defect and loss of memory will be more. And moreover, the uh, age is beyond 60 like that, that they are also their cognitive defects more. So our aim is to uh, give anesthesia as less as possible to reduce all the minor as well as major complications. Then, not only the patients, the people working in the OR are at risk. So, five years back, uh, we, uh, a national wide study was conducted in India from Pondicherry. Actually, they gave online uh, survey was done, and 9,974 anesthesiologists are involved. And, uh, and the results were quite alarming. They found that say, the risk of anesthesia practice people on reproductive outcome. They said the conclusion was the people who are working in uh, OR, they are difficult to conceive. The infertility is a problem, people working in OR. Not only that, actually, spontaneous abortion and birth defects are much more in female anesthesiologists working in OR during the first trimester. So, uh, uh, birth defects like uh, uh, urinary problems, renal problems, cardiac problems, autism, and then musculoskeletal problems, uh, then neurotube uh, defects, all sorts of things are there. So it's quite alarming. Not only for the female anesthesiologists, even the um, spouses of male anesthesiologists, it is found that the first trimester miscarriage is much more uh, than the general population. They are saying that because of the constant exposure of the gases, there is aberration in the DNA uh, for the even males and that can be transmitted, the chance of first trimester abortion is more uh, in the spouses of uh, male uh, anesthesiologists. But uh, for, uh, as a personal note, uh, I usually experience like this lot of uh, DA cases that uh, during that time I, can, I will have a good sleep <laughs> when I go home actually. <laughs> so, uh, regarding the mortality of Dela anesthesia, we should not worry much about the uh, mortality of Dela anesthesia because 
2013, WHO released a global status on road safety and they found that RTA mortality is 18 per 100,000 uh, per year, people per year. And when we come to GA mortality, it's actually, and the RTA mortality is increasing now, but the GA mortality is one in 300,000 and it's coming down actually. So, uh, a patient has higher chance of dying from RTA than from exposure of uh, uh, following a GA. So, we should not worry much about the mortality after GA. So, what makes anesthesia safe? So, this first safety factor starts from uh, pre anesthesia checkup. So, some of the studies they think that a pre anesthesia checkup is a waste of time and they will never, usually, they are very much reluctant to send the patient to uh, a pre anesthesia checkup even after repeated requests actually. It is not like that. So, during the pre anesthesia checkup, we have to address the concern, we have to clarify the uh, uh, fears and anxiety, then uh, we will come to know the diagnosis what type of surgery and if there any allergy is there and any past medical and surgical anesthesia history if there is any untoward problem happened before then relevant medication, which all medication we have to stop before and which have to uh, continue on the day of surgery then any abnormal lab values in basically features because we are taking a patient with some uh, problems for which the uh, surgery is posted on top of that, our A, we are inducing by giving anesthesia, we inducing we see a change so for that we will try to bring the patient as optimal as possible, as normal as possible if time permits. Then only we will start giving anesthesia, that is uh, to improve the safety factor. So only pre anesthesia checkup will come to know all, the, all those sort of things like that. And this will help, pre anesthesia checkup will help to plan the surgery and we get uh, uh, <coughs> any crisis or any, any problem we encounter during surgery, all will be known only from the pre anesthesia checkup and we will be prepared to tackle that crisis or problem. So that will be done by the pre anesthesia checkup. So pre anesthesia checkup is a vital thing for the safety of anesthesia for, say, for the patient. Not only will the pre anesthesia checkup, intraoperative also, for providing safe anesthesia, we always we monitor the surgery or stand of surgery and always we see the IV access and monitoring that and the airway management always we put the tube and we will manage that one, we will see that the should, tube should not pour out and like that, there, there should not be any kinky. Always we are managing that one. And anesthetic plan also, depending upon the current steps, we will change sometimes, we will change the uh, anesthesia plan, sometimes we are putting the patient on spinal anesthesia and the surgery is prolonged, then we may have to convert it to general anesthesia. So, uh, depending on the surgery and etc. plan, sometimes the anesthesia plan we have to change that. So, then kind of vital status, always we see the vital status every time and see if there is any change in the vital status, we immediately interfere and then we will bring back to normal. And blood loss and volume status assessment, always we will assess the blood loss and volume status. These are all the safety factors during the intraoperative period. And according to that, we will give additional medication depending upon the vital status, etc. And always we systematically scan the machine, monitor IV fluids, patient, and surgical field, and the eyes will be rotated, scanning all around in a cyclical fashion, always like that to provide a safe anesthesia activity. Then, what makes anesthesia safe? Anesthesia machine is a wonderful thing uh, for the safety of anesthesia. In this juncture, I remember one incident. Uh, as I told, I joined as a lecturer in the anesthesia department immediately after my MBBS. At the time, one day, uh, I happened to be, uh, I just went to the author theater. One case is going on, so I want to finish one author case actually. It's a young chap, a little year old uh, boy uh, was there actually. And uh, my associate professor, she is uh, was there, and one injured was there uh, in the, uh, that OT. So I'm talking with the uh, madam. So the operation was over. Then madam told the guy, just uh, uh, case is over, so please switch off uh, uh, nitrous oxide and make it oxygen. So that, that guy switched off the nitrous oxide and made oxygen. After some time, madam told the sister to give reversal. So the sister gave the reversal, we waited for five, ten minutes, and I'm talking with her, madam, then still the patient is not coming out. The madam is saying, what happened? The patient is not coming out. Then she checked, cross-checked with the sister. Sister, whether you have given the reversal or some, some other drugs. So uh, she cross-checked and she told, no, madam, so you reversal. Then we waited again and five, ten minutes still, the patient is not coming out. Then madam, by chance, she looked into the, uh, to the anesthesia machine. So when she looked, immediately the heart stops few, be missed few beats because that guy, instead of stopping nitrous oxide, he stopped oxygen. So for this 20-25 minutes, the patient is getting only nitrous oxide. So no oxygen at all. Immediately, madam stops the nitrous oxide and the oxygen, but already damage has done. Patient went to pulmonary edema and uh, cerebral edema, and the patient was immediately shifted to an ICU, and on the fourth day, they, the guy expired. It's very sad, actually. So, uh, uh, see, if that patient would have been today, that patient would not have died, because 
Today machine, we cannot give a hypoxic mixture to the patient. If we stop by chance, by mistake, if we stop oxygen, naturally the nitrous oxide also will come down. We cannot give a hypoxic mixture to the uh, patient now. So that is the beauty of uh, today's machine. And previously, we don't have anything. We have to squeeze even in the middle of the night also. We have to squeeze only. But now this machine, we can put it on volume control. This machine will take care of uh, all the ventilation part. So that's the machine plays a very vital role in providing a safe anesthesia. And we have a very good machine actually. Monitoring equipment, again, during when we start, when I started, there's no much monitoring equipment. Always we keep two fingers uh, on the pulse. And in between, we check the, uh, uh, manually we check the blood pressure. And uh, there's no pulse oximeter. At the time we just look at the blood every day, discoveration, blood becomes too dark, then we'll come to know that oxygen is less, then we'll uh, increase the oxygen. So these are the only uh, uh, monetary equipments we have. If we have a patient, we stab the uh, stethoscope with plasters in the chest and we always listen to the heart sounds. These are the only monitors available at that time. But now it's not like that. We have very good gadgets. If any uh, Deviation immediately alarm will be set, we will come to know. So now the safety is added a lot actually. Then uh, now we have safer drugs and equipment. Then advancement in airway management is fantastic actually. Previously, when I started at the time, we cannot, if we cannot inhibit, nothing else is there. Now it's not like that. We have a lot of choices out there. We have LMA, ProSeal, everything is there, and fibrotic endoscope is a wonderful thing that. Uh, we we got a uh, year, year back. Actually, with the fiber optic endoscope, we can uh, we are sure that we are so confident that we can secure the airway. However, obese the patient is that we never failed till now with the fiber optic endo endoscopes. So a lot of advancement in the airway management has come. Uh, that definitely anesthesia skill and knowledge. Then we just go on with the guidelines, protocol, and checklist. This is to, pro uh, to for the safety of the patient and to prevent errors which usually happens. So to prevent that one, we usually follow the guidelines, protocol, and checklist, and definitely surgical skill has also improved. The duration of time of surgery is reduced, thereby it added on to the safety of anesthesia. So safe anesthesia, actually a, a, a pilot, before starting the uh, uh, flight, they will check the cockpit. Like that daily, we check the, our anesthesia machine for any leak is there, or then we will uh, uh, calibrate the oxygen sensor, or uh, in flow, flow sensor, everything we calibrate and we will we'll check the uh, backup equipment and other devices uh, every day morning we will check up that and label all the medications. That's very important to avoid the uh, medication error. It's very, very important because we cannot, anybody cannot come and work in anesthesia. They need some training. They should know what all drugs which we are taking and they, we, they, 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 we, we are so particular that always it will be loaded in the syringe and it will be labeled actually. And the patient, people handle it will be few because they know the drugs about that. The person who handle uh, draws will be, will be there for, for giving the uh, drugs. Because the problem is the IV uh, medication, once we pushed it, we cannot take it back. So that's why we are very really particular and we see that it should not happen, that, that no medication ever should happen. So always we are very much particular in that. And always we keep it ready with all the equipment to uh, tackle any unexpected problems. Usually we, we land up in unexpected difficult airway. So we think that airway is okay, but at the time of uh, intubation, when we looked up, we cannot see anything. So immediately we will take a uh, fiber endoscope or LMA. So everything will be kept ready. So always we are ready for the safety of anesthesia. So we have all proper armament there to provide a safe anesthesia. And uh, safety factors starts with the preoperative assessment. Uh, after that, we will plan the surgery and during the operative day, we check the machine and monitors. Then we prepare a vision box space to see the machine monitors and uh, patient and surgical field. Then we, uh, we check the backup equipment, everything is ready. Then always we label the medications to prevent as a part of the patient safety strategy. Then, in spite of all that, sometimes accidents can occur. It's a multifactorial thing and main cause is uh, system failure. These are all uh, electronic gadgets. Sometimes it, it may fail, so we will be very much careful. Uh, that may be the cause, and we, we will we always be aware of that. And then human errors. If we deviate from the usual policies and guidelines, the chance of getting error will be more. And so we always stick on to the usual policies and guidelines. And many a time, uh, a, a human error accident occurs. For a simple case, we never expect any problem. So that time, we, there will be a laxity in the vigilance. In such cases, always we will add a bit of problem. So we are so particular, even if it's a small case, we, we will not uh, reduce our vigilance. Always we are vigil vigilant because we don't want any accidents to happen. Then a uh, lot of errors are already already documented. So we are very particular to see that, that errors should not happen. 
especially air way error. So uh, even at the at the instance of the error ticket, we make sure that it is in the track here. We have now gadgets to know that whether it's going to be in fact or not going to uh, error ticket tube, etc. OT is there, will be uh, uh, oscillated in the chest, etc. And then once it's intimated, it should not be see that it should not come out actually. Especially if you change the position from uh, uh, supine position, if you change the patient's in the prone position, then during that time, sometimes the uh, tube will come out. So we are very particular that it should not happen so that we are reinforce the tube with, twice with the dynaplast and on top of that we will reinforce with the off site also. So it should not come out because if the patient in this uh, prone position during the middle of the surgery, if the tube comes out, it's a disaster. We cannot take, turn the patient back, we cannot intubate in that position. So we are very particular to see that it should not happen and we are very careful that till now we don't have any problem till now. Uh, then position errors. During different position, we are very much worried it should not happen any problem with the eyeballs or any pressure points. We take care of that to avoid position errors. Medicine errors, I, I, I told that we are very particular that there should not be any uh, medicine errors. Till now, we don't have any uh, uh, medicine errors thanks to our uh, good uh, 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 technician and other team actually. Then uh, procedure errors. Sometimes there are procedure errors can occur. Uh, though we try our best to avoid procedures or like enough, enough different IV injections for local anesthesia. Every time we aspirate in between to see that it is, there's no blood is coming out, it's negative for blood and then we can proceed. And also epidural hematoma, we see all all we all the precautions to avoid this epidural hematoma. In the way is aspirin, we stop the aspirin five days back and we take all the precautions for that. And human error sometimes we deviate from the accepted anesthesia practice we, we may land in uh, problems. So we always stick on with the accepted anesthesia practice. And also fatigue, because we are seeing that we see that uh, uh, if uh, they should not uh, fatigue so should not be a problem there. Uh, late night they have we give them hyper press like that. Then apart from that, uh, we have additional uh, uh, factors are there in, in increasing the anesthesia risk. From the patient side, if the patient is having uh, age factor, uh, younger age or uh, old age like that, and with comorbids can cause a problem. Then procedures, sometimes the elective cases, you don't have much time to optimize the patient. In such cases, it, it gives a, a risk actually. Then uh, depending on the resources, equipment and monitoring facilities of our hospital, in that we are very much rich actually, we are very much lucky to have a good resource and equipment and monitoring facilities are there. So that if we, if he doesn't have all these things, then it, it, uh, it causes it causes additional risk for uh, the safety, and we have a, a skilled anesthesiologists and surgeons, and always the physicians are ready to help help us out if we need we difficulty. So, so these are the additional factors, risk factors for the safety. Then uh, altogether, the safety starts with the patient, and then uh, it uh, go on to the facilities of the hospital. Then depending upon the uh, anesthesia skill and as well as surgeon. So it's a teamwork. So all of this includes for the safety factors, patient, equipment, skill of the anesthesia, skill of the surgeons for the uh, safe anesthesia. So always we try to improve the quality of care. If we improve the quality of care, uh, the safety will improve actually by observing the standard protocols and guidelines. Always we have a constant vigil uh, uh, to the monitors if any problem occurs. Like immediately we have a constant vigil. And even a small change, attention to the detail, if any slight change in the vitals, immediately we, we, we interfere, we will not uh, wait till the problem goes to the bigger problem. So, also we did is there. But still, in spite we are human beings, sometimes we may have mistakes, so but we learn from the mistakes and improve and we have a proper documentation. Uh, this all adds on the safety of anesthesia actually. Thus, we always try to make anesthesia miraculously safe. Then, uh, I believe that patient safety starts with me. Each one of us, the patient coming for your anesthesia clearance, the patient sitting uh, other other side of you, you should believe that that uh, safety of that patient lies in your in you actually. So all together, it's a teamwork actually. All together, we can make anesthesia a miraculously safety. Thank you. That's what we are learning that actually 
a uh, lot of things are there now, newer, newer things are there to reduce that one. Because now we have a scavenging system that whatever uh, uh, gases coming, it will not come to the air, it will be taken out and it will be given to that so that the uh, uh, whole atmosphere will not be polluted, number one. Number two is that uh, if you have too much BC, it's better to uh, move to some other uh, less busy uh, theater or they can take first time, that's a much crucial time, it's better to take. So, but certain uh, really, uh, that I see shows, they, they will take leave actually for the first uh, three months until, uh, because they will write the time itself. So, whatever best possible we can do because of the uh, newer things that. Yes, possible. Yes, possible. So that's why if we have a scavenging system, it will absorb the whatever expired gas is coming, spillover gas is coming, it will suck into them and uh, that there may be less problem. In spite of all, all that, sometimes uh, definitely uh, the atmosphere, uh, OT atmosphere is a little bit gas will be there. Will be, will be there. Yeah. Is that the reason why you laugh so much? Uh, <laughs> I don't think because uh, <laughs> yeah, that, in that case, what should be laughing like that? <laughs> Then if you look at it, you will be something to know that whether they are checked at what time length. 